12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you, still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others were with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying them by themselves. And he went away, wondering himself what had happened. Thank you, Phil. Well, it's great to see everybody here today. What a great time to be with family, and uh, I understand some of you have some extra family. We're just glad everybody's here today. Congratulations to all the kids who went to LTC and did a great job there. There was all kinds of things that uh, they were under able to win, and I understand our small chorus was asked to perform. If you're on Facebook, you can see all kinds of different things. Daniel and Ashley, you guys had a really great job with the kids singing and everything, so it's really great to see all of those things that are happening around. Uh, you remember, I just want to remind you at the end of the service, if you have a prayer request that you want the elders to read, be sure you come and give it to them. If you passed it and put it in the collection plate, well, we'll send those out on, on Monday, so make sure you're subscribed and we'll, we'll make sure you have all the information about prayers that are needed here. Because that's one of the things that's especially important, is being able to go to God in prayer. I think some people are prepared for life and have everything together. They have insurance on everything. They have an extended warranty. They still don't feel right, quite right about it all, but as much as possible, they are ready for every single situation. And then there's the rest of us who uh, aren't sure what's for lunch today. <laughs> and uh, we don't know what's going to happen next year. We're just enjoying life and going along. And uh, those are two very different approaches. Most people don't prepare much for the end of life. We do a better job preparing for tomorrow than we do anything else. But we still run into those bad times. We still run into times that are difficult. And I just want you to know today, there's no cure. You're not going to get out of them. I knew that was the good news. <laughs> but it goes like this. You have to go through good times and bad times to get where you're trying to go. And there is a better place that we're trying to go. And so that's the thing you have to realize is there are better things. That's the whole sermon right there. Okay, so if you got that part, we're good. Put it another way. No rain, no flowers. It's just that simple. If you aren't going to go through difficult times, there's not going to be any glory later. There's, and you're going to go through difficult times, so you might as well realize this is the whole principle of what resurrection is. There are things that are going to go along, but there's going to be a trial. There's going to be affliction. There's going to be death. And that's the good news, because there's something better later. And that's always the great thing that we're able to have. We talked last week about how the world is sinful, 
that there's no one good enough, that there's no one that we're able to have. And so here's what happened is we have taken the world and looked at all the different things around and we have caused so much destruction. And it's not just destruction in the world and destruction in nature, but it's destruction in each other. Because there's a lot of people here this morning whose hearts look like this. Somewhere they got bombed out. And life doesn't seem so happy and it doesn't seem so good except for what we're doing here today. And that is the fact that Jesus is risen. God made someone bad enough by putting all of our sins on him so that we could be good enough to live with him. We can't fix all the mistakes. I heard in class this morning there's been bombings in Sri Lanka of, of churches. There's hundreds dead. Why are they targeting us? Well, it's kind of been a tradition. We've had it good for a while, but you can't fix all the mistakes. If you run over somebody's cat, you can't fix it. There's no way to, to do anything with that. So some things you, you just can't fix. Now you can forgive and you can get past it and you can go on. But it doesn't mean everything in life is going to be perfect and that everything's going to go just, just the way it's supposed to. We can pay for things. We can have the price paid for justice. But we don't fix them. We get over them. And we go on from there. And so what happened to Jesus is he took all of our sin and his death was horrible. And maybe that's why, is it wasn't just a sudden thing, but all of the horrible things that are the nature of us and the nature of our sin and all the pain that we have endured and caused was put on him. And he died. And we see it. We read it. It's in his word. You realize there's not any single thing that was done to him that actually killed him. It's just all of it together. He died. Wow. That, that's kind of incredible, isn't it? When it's just all of the things that were put on him at once. And he can no longer live. But the good thing about Jesus is he died for you and me, he laid down his life. And when sin had done the worst possible it could do to him, he got up and went home. It was three days later. He was not guilty of anything. He had died for our sins, and that was all paid. That was all taken care of. And he didn't need a death for his sins because he didn't have any. And so the passage that Phil read to us this morning is about the... What happens after that? And it's interesting to see the way that we look at all of this. The women came to the tomb and they're carrying spices. Because they know where they're going. They're going to a grave. And he's been in there three days already. And there's nothing they're going to do to make it better. Except maybe to put enough spices on to where he'll smell better where he won't stink as much. And sometimes that's all people think Christianity is, is it's trying to make us not stink as much. But there's better news than that. There's something so much better than that. It's not just being able to cover up all the stuff that goes wrong. It's the fact that Jesus died, the fact that Jesus rose again. And so we remember all of this that we can see. We remember that the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why were they there? I mean, he had told them this already. He had told them, I'm going to be delivered over to the hands of evil men and I will die. I will be crucified. I will be buried. I will rise three days later. And they, they knew that already. They understood that already. Well, at least they'd heard that already. But how many things have you heard that 
You just don't know how to live that. And that's what becomes so much harder. Why seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember that he told you. And sure enough, he did tell them. Well, we didn't know he was alive. We thought he was dead. And I guess we didn't believe when they said it. And Peter then, after everybody else has already come back, the women come back, other people go, and Peter has to go himself and look in. And yeah, sure enough, he's not here. Doesn't see angels this time, but he, and they're all trying to make sense out of this, trying to understand this. And I think we do the same thing today. We're trying to make sense out of something that we've never seen and don't quite understand. It's a struggle to understand what life is like after this one. And the Bible gives us some clues, but it doesn't tell us everything. My question is, can you believe in the resurrection enough to plan for it? To make it part of your life, to make it something you can count on, that you can depend on. Do we have enough faith to believe in resurrection? You see, there was a person before this who was faced with the same issue, but I think it might have been a little bit more personal. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read about Abraham. In verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham had done so many things. He had moved when God told him to move to a complete foreign country. He, God had said, I'm going to bless you with a child. He had waited 25 years for the blessing of the child. That's a long time to be pregnant, don't you think? I mean, you're planning it. Well, maybe next year we'll have a child. You know he's coming. He's just not there yet. But you've still got the crib, and uh, you can't throw it away or give it away yet. You know that, you know, it's going to happen. You're sure. And Isaac is born, and everything is wonderful. And he grows up, and wow, my life is all together until God says, you know what? Here's a test. I want you to offer your son. And as he goes, the next day, and takes with him Isaac, wood, fire. And he comes to a mountain. And the two of them go up. And he's standing over his son with a knife. He believes in God. And that what God says is true. And that if God promised him that this child laying on this altar is the promise for the future of the world, then he is. And if he believes in what God says, then he believes that God said, I want you to offer that child to me. Now, those are not logical. They don't make any sense to us. How can you have both of those fit together? And somehow Abraham comes up with, then God's going to give him back. Then I believe in resurrection. Because even if I kill him now, he is the promised child. And he was talking about Jesus. That there's going to be a descendant who's going to go through this exact scenario. That's going to offer up his life for our sin. Who can be raised from the dead. My question is, can you do it? Can you go through this? Can you be on the altar? Can you be raised from the dead? That's the only way it works, you know. We don't get out of life alive. We're not going to find a cure. Even if you find a cure, that's not what you want. It's not so that we can live longer and longer in a body that gets older and older. I'm not sure that's really a good solution 
even if we found it. It's that we believe that what's lost can be found, that what's dead can be alive, that what's sinful can be made holy, and that Jesus was raised and he can raise us. We believe in resurrection. Can you believe in the death of a son? Can you believe in the death of a friend, of a wife, of everyone? That we are all going to be together again. This isn't the last day that there's going to be a time when we are all in heaven. And I think Justin's going to lead singing. So how did Jesus do this? How did he live for resurrection? Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus did it first. He showed us how to do this. He showed us exactly how it's going to happen. We're surrounded by people of faith, and that's what you read about in, in Hebrews 11, and then you get to chapter 12, and it says this is how Jesus did it. He saw what was coming next. He saw how great it was going to be next. And yes, life is hard. There are difficult things you will get through. There is always going to be affliction, and yet, there is something greater on the other side. Remember, that's the whole thing, right? You got that? And that's what we see with all of this. This is exactly what we see Jesus doing because he knew there was something better, because he knows that there's something more. He says, we run the race. We get into the You have to participate in the race on purpose. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, you're in the middle. No, you have to intentionally sign up for the race and decide, yes, I want to be resurrected. And I'm going to follow that resurrection. I'll enact it here first with my baptism, a burial, and then raised to walk a new life. And then I'm going to enact it physically as I see this come out, and I'm going to be raised to walk in heaven, raised to walk in a place of glory, because this is what life is all about. And Jesus invites us to do that. For the joy set before him. You go through the bad to get to the good. And Jesus looks beyond the horror of the cross to the glory that lies ahead. What dies is what's in us. What's raised is what's from him. We recognize this principle throughout all of life in everything that we see. When everything seems to be going against you, remember it's the airplane that takes off against the wind, not with it. It is only in our struggle, it is only in our affliction that we gain anything in life. It is not about all the easy times that you've had. When you look back, you remember all the days that you slept, right? All the naps that you took. And you say, man, I had a great time sleeping. I napped through my whole life. I did. No. Nobody's so proud of that, that I slept through it all and didn't wake up till later. I'm not sure that's a great accomplishment. But we have this promise. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, and I think he describes it pretty well. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is for all your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory 
beyond all comparison. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. An eternal weight of glory. Isn't that incredible? You ever heard somebody complain about how the gold in their pocket's too heavy? Why not? It's the heaviest thing. We don't complain about that because we understand the value. We understand the value of what Jesus is about to give us. We have a faith like his. We believe in the Bible, but we believe it's the word of God. We believe enough to be able to speak. We see grace being extended to more and more people. It's extended even to us. And so we don't lose heart because we believe even though things are not easy, even though things are not simple, because there's this inner renewal that takes place on the most difficult of days. When we learn so much more then, is affliction part of your life? I'm sure it is. Anybody want to say, no, I have a perfect life and nothing ever goes wrong? We got that person? Yeah, I didn't think so. Maybe you're just shy, so... Come tell me afterwards, all right? I want to know about that person. Affliction produces glory. That's what he's trying to say here. Because you have to go through the bad to get to the good. The momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. And we get different sight. We see the world different. It's not trying to hang on to what's physical, on to all the stuff that we see that we might like, that we might enjoy now because there's something greater that's coming. It's going to be so much better. It's going to be so exciting. And we know that we realize that the things that we see right now are just temporary. And we're going to give up our life for him so that we can get something better so that we can be in his presence, so that we can share in the grace of God, so that we can share his holiness. And he did all of what he did so that we could join him. We all have a cross or affliction in this life. We don't get out of it. We're looking for a place to be with God that has no evil. We can all get together here but it's all part of realizing there is still a world out there. So we go to a cross. He told us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow. Affliction's always part. It's going to be part if you try and live your life right, because there will be people who don't want you to do that. But just remember what you're able to get. That Jesus is preparing for us a new life, something that is so much better. I saw this also. On particularly rough days, I like to remind myself that my track record for getting through bad days so far is 100%. And that's pretty good. You're going to make it through it. It's going to be okay. You are going to get there. Even if you won everything in your life, you still have a cross and you still have a tomb. I want both of those to be empty. When the cross is empty, you're going to be in a tomb. When the tomb is empty, you're going to be in glory. What a great thing that is. And where are people going to look for you? Are they going to look where they put you? Where they scattered you, where they planted you, go back and remember you being there. I hope not. I hope they're just going to say, I'm coming. It's going to be a better place. Will you need angels to direct people to say, well, you know, he's not here, you understand. Yeah, because resurrection is going to happen. We're going to be with him. We don't need other people to tell us where we are. So what's the point of all of this? What do we do? What's the practical takeaway? The fact that there is going to be glory and times are hard now. Well, that doesn't really help me now. Yeah, it does. 
I want you to live like you have something coming. I want you to live like it's two weeks till your birthday. You realize they don't put any presents out. They're not under a tree anywhere. You can't see them. There is no cake that is sitting out on the counter. You don't realize it. You don't see it. You just know that year's coming. And I know what day it is. And it's going to come. And, that's, and there's going to be a party, right? And there's going to be cake. And there's going to be presents. And we get ice cream. And it's going to be a great day when we get to, well, not so much now that we're older, right? It's like maybe it's not such a happy day after all. <laughs> Buy yourself a good present. It'll be all right. <laughs> but I just want you to know that that's what it is. We start to live for then, now. Because I just have to get through this to get there. And so I want to see the smile on your face. I want to see the way that you talk to people as if there is something better because I am going there. And I'm telling you that now so you don't have to have angels tell you then. Right? Do you want to be there? Do you want to be in that place? I like Easter. It's one of the best times ever because the whole world knows Jesus is risen. It is out there. And we are the ones who take advantage of it because we are in the race. And we are in it to be raised. We're not going to survive it. We're going to do a whole lot better than that. We're going to go to a new place where God reigns and where we don't have to put up with any of this. We're going to be in that great place of glory. And if God designed creation and all of the beauty around us and all of the things that we see as the place where sin's allowed, what do you think it's like up there? I'm sure there's no allergies. <laughs> it is going to be a great place. I hope you're ready to go there. If you're not ready to go there, then we need to work on that. Come talk to me. We need to be able to do something so you are absolutely positive that you're looking forward to that resurrection.